Yeah, you guys are really committed to this joke. I commend you. Who's joking? Yeah. Oh. Well, it's nothing. Nothing? You're not mad enough for two jokes. I know, Carl Ryan. <laughs> we live in a world somewhat dominated by nerd culture. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, Star Wars, and every other nerdy media franchise has been accepted by mainstream global culture with open arms. However, it wasn't always this way. There was a time when being a quote unquote nerd wouldn't have won you points at your school cafeteria table. Some have pointed to the rise of sitcoms like The Big Bang Theory or the ubiquity of Harry Potter or Twilight as the cultural touchstones that allowed for wider acceptance. In reality though, that turning point might have been a little TV show that managed to sneak in a bit of a real change. A show set in Orange County. See, it's arguable that Adam Brody's Seth Cohen of The O.C. was an engine of cultural change. It's hard to imagine a time when the nerdy outsider wasn't positioned as the cool know-it-all, but that was the case. Did you say you need a ride to a Star Wars convention? The Star Wars convention? I'm sorry, her top was off. You couldn't have at least said X-Men for me? Prior to Seth Cohen, nerds generally weren't cool. The writers of the show went out of their way to play the character of Seth and his idiosyncratic interests and obsessions as a positive thing, not something to be mocked. This was a radical departure from the style and habit with which characters like Seth were treated in other media. Remember Revenge of the Nerds? Nerds! Nerds! That's a whole Nerds! movie franchise ostensibly built off of Look at the Dorks. The OC was a television show that ran from 2003 to 2007, created by screenwriter Josh Schwartz. The show starred Adam Brody, Ben McKenzie, Misha Barton, and Rachel Bilson. In the hands of a more traditional showrunner, the primetime soap opera would have been a standard run-of-the-mill 90210 clone. You know the formula, the CW is practically weaponized at this point. You get a bunch of attractive 20-somethings, pair them up, do the whole will they won't they dance, and play catchy pop music underneath shots of them making out. And while the OC definitely had those elements within it, it also had something more. It's got a lot of testosterone pumping right now, Ryan. Testosterone being the key ingredient missing from Alex's previous relationship. I just need a reminder of that. The OC's premise is a fish out of water story following Ryan Atwood, played by Mackenzie, as a kid from the wrong side of the tracks who ends up in Orange County. Pretty stereotypical. He's then adopted by the well-off Cohen family. We follow Ryan as he attempts to navigate the sometimes vapid, sometimes insidious world of California high school, all with the assistance of his newfound best friend by proxy, Seth. On paper, Seth was a nerdy, lanky Jewish kid who was into indie music and comic books. This character has been featured in a million other TV shows and media as the brunt of everyone's joke. He's the bespectacled best friend relegated to the supporting role. However, the fact that both Schwartz and longtime writer on the show, Alan Heinberg, were deeply avid comic book heads meant they wanted to depict Brody's character as the cool outsider, which is exactly what happened. Seth's brooding, overlooked individualism skyrocketed the character to popularity overnight. He quickly became a style icon of the early 2000s. He knew all the coolest bands, read all the coolest books, and had seen all the coolest movies. How did you first come up with the lightsaber? The show flipped the let's make fun of the nerdy kid for liking Star Wars trope on its head almost immediately. Brody's casting helped aid in this. Yes, you need the cute girls, flashy edits, and luxurious California locations, but Adam Brody is what made the show unique. He's the charismatic cast member who makes the most of every scene. He wrings every possibility for humor and charm out of every line. And let's also remember for a second that the landscape of primetime soap operas in the early 2000s was very different. Today, it feels like every one of these shows is literally based on a comic book property, like Riverdale and Archie. However, back in 2000, the primetime soaps that existed wanted nothing to do with anything of that kind. One Tree Hill, Desperate Housewives, Gossip Girl, and other shows of their ilk all had a specific and refined aesthetic. Glossy cinematography, instantly of the moment fashions, and impossibly good looking people who looked genetically engineered in a lab. The shows focused on the interpersonal drama and love lives of these characters, but rarely focused on their passions, interests, or character details outside of the direct conflict of the week. The OC managed to fit in that box, but flipped those storytelling conventions on their head, delving deeper into their characters' intentions, their lives, and what mattered to them. The show generated audience empathy for their cast by exploring everything a traditional primetime soap did, while also exploring the characters' less than conventional interests as well. In many ways, Seth was everyone's gateway. Both the audience and the characters on the show were introduced to cool new pieces of media and fell in love with them. People who normally would not engage in some of these things, but would watch the OC, were now doing so. Whether it be films or comic books, it was some's introduction 
to those things. In one episode, Seth goes to the literal offices of Wildstorm Comics in San Diego to pitch a comic book series. This is to say nothing of the ubiquitous Wonder Woman, Flash, and other comic book character jokes. There's a whole arc where Seth gets Ryan into reading the Legion of Superheroes. As if these references weren't enough for you, there's also the fact that Seth routinely has lengthy monologues about comic book creators like Brian Michael Bendis. The show mainstreamed the idea that cool people could be into nerdy things a good 10 years before that conversation was actually happening within the zeitgeist of pop culture. And they didn't do this superficially, it was a very specific version of that conversation. Usually, movies or media that feature nerdy obsessions were aimed at men and created by men. Think Kevin Smith or Tarantino. Most of these dialogue-specific auteurs weren't aiming their projects at young women. They were trying to appeal to male film buffs because, well, that's who they were. The OC well, it was a decidedly glossy network primetime soap, as I already mentioned, that just happened to have these peculiar interests. These conversations and long monologues were being smuggled into a show primarily watched by teenage girls. There's even a running thread where Seth tries to get Summer into Batman by giving her Dark Knight Returns. Sorry, off with some basics. Batman, The Dark Knight Returns, is very important. Uh, Watchmen and The Sandman. Enjoy. And it wasn't just comics, this happened with music. Hide and Seek by Imogen Heap became a viral meme due to its use in the show. He became a superstar musical act almost overnight due to the OC. This goes for the band Phantom Planet as well. Their record The Guest shot up the indie charts after their song California was selected to be the show's intro credit song. And much of this was thanks to Alexandra Hatsavas, who picked out all the bands that would appear on the show and specifically what music Seth Cohen would listen to during the episodes. The show's musical orientation became so well known that they introduced a fictional location, the Bait Shop, intended to be similar to how the Peach Pit or the Bronze were. There, they literally had record labels courting the OC's producers, attempting to get them to spotlight their bands, sending them merch, free records, and calling their personal home phone numbers to attempt to sway them into using their label's bands on the program. Let's not forget that after all of this, Adam Brody was literally cast as the Flash in George Miller's Justice League Mortal, which would have launched a Flash franchise of movies out of it, which unfortunately never happened due to the mid-2000s WGA writer's strike, but it still kind of happened, at least in conception. Modern memory of the OC seems to be, oh yeah, wasn't that the one show where they killed Misha Barton off? Which is fascinating considering that it was a highly rated and critically lauded primetime program. Unfortunately, only lasting four seasons, but in that time, it had six soundtracks released, compiling all the bands it featured on the show. However, during the third season, the show seemingly lost its way, didn't quite know what to do with its characters, and, well, permanently damaged its public perception. The old adage of don't judge a book by its cover is so tired and fatigued that it's almost ridiculous to even say at this point. There's good reason that we judge books by their covers. That's why they're there. But that doesn't mean that you should avoid every cover that catches your eye. And better yet, when you're creating, it doesn't mean that your book needs to be exactly what's on the cover. You can be a primetime soap opera that cares more about what's happening in nerd culture than it does fashion culture. Once you have your structure with whatever you're making, whatever you're doing, as long as it's consistent, don't let the structure you've already created be a hindrance. Use it to your advantage. Introduce people to something new. Introduce yourself to something new. It's not the best thing in the world to bait and switch, but baiting and surprising is a whole different story. Well guys, that's it for today's episode of Nerdstalgic. If you enjoyed this one, press the like button down below. If you haven't yet done so, as you know, hit the subscribe button. You won't miss anything. I'm sure right now, probably two more episodes. You can click on either of those. Stay here, hopefully. I will see you guys in one of those, or well, just maybe the next one.